Good morning, friends. Happy Easter. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. I am coming to you from the my other work place, which is called Transform Cincy in Silverton. Um, this week has been a little bit difficult to uh, get a space to record. Um, so here I am in a gathering space here in Transform Cincy. Enjoy the couch. <laughs> Let's begin with a prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen.
reading from the book of Acts. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses, sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Let us say Psalm 133 in unison. How good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like fine oil upon the head that runs down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, and runs down upon the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon that falls upon the hills of Zion. For there has God ordained the blessing, life forevermore. The Gospel for today is from the 20th chapter of John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God and that through believing you may have life in his name. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Again, happy Easter, friends. So exciting to be in this season of new life when so much feels not like that. First, and mostly unrelated to what I'm gonna talk about, I think that it's important to note that the Gospel of John and one particular phrase that's repeated in it have been used for a long time to denigrate and destroy our Jewish brothers and sisters. I want to be clear, I say this separate from what's going on in Gaza right now, just the awareness of this. When the writers of John speak of the disciples being afraid of the Jews, it doesn't come across to us that all of them were Jewish. The people that they feared, the disciples, Jesus himself, 
This is a family fight that's happening within the Gospel of John. Over the years, the way that this gospel speaks of Jesus has fueled massive anti-Semitism. I mentioned this the other week. It might be less provoking and more clear to say something like the religious authority in most of those spaces, the naming of the system, the naming of the human propensity to mess things up, rather than a particular group, many of whom didn't know or care what was going on. Translation is complex, and we can choose to translate in a way that is both accurate and not hurtful. Say that out loud. Anyway, years ago, when my son Jackson was just born, all 11 pounds of him, if you can believe it, and his sibling Blue was four years old, I was changing him in their shared room Blue came in, like cracked the door open and stuck their head in. They stage whispered to me, peace be with you. And then went, ah. and they closed the door and disappeared. I blinked at the door. What in the world? And then realization dawned. I had been telling them various God stories as they called them. And they were reenacting the resurrection appearance with Thomas. Blue and Jackson, both are a lot like Thomas, actually. They wanna know all kinds of things. How does lightning happen? How do you make charcoal? What was the technology like in the 90s? They wanna know, in the Bible, are these real people or are they stories? Both. They wanna know, at school, we talk about how the earth took millions of years to get like this. And at church, sometimes they tell us six days both. They want to know, are people good or bad? <laughs> both. Their brains are so big and so curious, just like your kids, just like you. Isn't that glorious? That we can ask the question like Mary Magdalene did. Jesus' body is not here. Where have you taken him? Or like Mary, the mother of Jesus did, how can this be since I am a virgin? Or like Thomas did, how can I believe that he was raised from the dead unless I can see him and touch him? Thomas gets a bad rap in the church. We call him Doubting Thomas with this implied condescension. Ooh, Thomas, don't doubt, just believe. I realize that's not exactly how we say it, <laughs> but it strikes me that this is a false binary. People across our scriptures ask questions. They wonder if something can really be, and they push back against God. Thomas was in pain. His friend of three years had died. His, his hope that Jesus represented real change for the world had died. What kind of sick joke is it for the others to gang up on him and pretend they have seen Jesus that night that he wasn't with them? So rude. Yeah, okay, sure, he's still alive. Remember how they crucified him in front of us? And how they stabbed him in the side with a spear? And how Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea buried him with a hundred pounds of spices on top of him? No way to walk away from that easily. Okay guys, sure, he's alive. I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> it's only natural. Sometimes we call that sin or apostasy or atheism. And the desire to learn more, to understand the makeup of the universe, some parts of the church condemn it, but it's a gift. It's how we grow. Jesus shows himself to Thomas, actually. He offers his wounds for Thomas to touch and confirm with his senses. I am not sold that Jesus is criticizing Thomas when he says, do not doubt, but believe. Maybe don't doubt any longer, believe that I am really here. It's a plea to be seen, an invitation for Thomas to move away from his mourning. Maybe it's a hair's breadth difference, but it's an important one. Jesus saying, don't doubt, is thrown around all the time to quell questions or to identify who is in and who's out. Doubters apparently are out and believers in. Now, just to be clear, I'm not ragging on believers here. That's pretty much us. I'm saying because there's nuance, or maybe there's nuance and complexity 
in what Jesus says. And maybe it's a false choice that we set up between the two, belief and doubt. The great playwright Václav Havel wrote, isn't it the moment of most profound doubt that gives birth to new certainties? Perhaps hopelessness is the very soil that nourishes human hope. Perhaps one could never find sense in life without first experiencing its absurdity. And theologian Paul Tillich wrote, doubt is not the opposite of faith. It is one element of faith. See, I think this story isn't about doubt or sin, even though it seems like that on the surface. I think it's about misery. The disciples in that upper room, afraid for their lives because Jesus was crucified, what was likely going to happen to them? And grieving for their friend and their teacher, they're miserable. Thomas doesn't believe them because he's so deep in his grief. And then with Jesus' presence and word and breath, they are comforted, lifted up even into a new understanding. Jesus breathes on them and reminds them and fills them with the breath of God. It's a story about comfort in the midst of tragedy, and it's not a naive effort. It's not a comfort that tries to wipe the slate clean as though nothing tragic had happened. Jesus arrives with his wounds clearly visible. He comes to them completely open-hearted, hiding nothing, offering everything. And Thomas, dear Thomas, sitting with his arms folded, his eyes closed tight to hold back the grief, his whole body tense. He hears Jesus' voice and he just melts. Thomas, our brother, receives the proof that he's asking for, the proof that the other disciples got the week before. Thomas, who is us, sees in front of him the impossible. Possible. Jesus appeared to Thomas almost as a special visit just for him, since he wasn't there the first time. And like the others, he breathes on him. Jesus reminds Thomas he is filled with God's breath, even in the middle of his doubt and misery. Jesus shows up for Thomas and gives him what he wants, proof, and also what he needs, knowing he is loved and that his sadness is not the end of the story. For us, Misery is all around. You know your own wounds better than I do. We are greedy and grasping. We are willfully ignorant as we click past news articles. We speak in terms of should and ought and how we aren't enough. We yell at each other and paint each other with villainous brushes. We read the world and each other with eyes filled with doubt about anyone's motivations. There's no way we can be like the disciples sharing the faith, even with our own children. There's no way we can be like the martyrs or the activists consent, content to sacrifice themselves. We don't know enough. We aren't enough. It feels like that failure that Roger talked about on Easter. And yet we are enough and we can. We are all Peter with his exuberance. We are all Mary and Martha and Lazarus who loved Jesus like a brother. We're all Thomas who wanted more to go on and who crashed to his knees when he got it. We are enough because we have God's breath in our lungs. And this is the kernel of this gospel reading for me. Deeper than doubt, deeper than misery and comfort, not Thomas, but Jesus breathing on them. <laughs> it's weird, I know. Remember creation and God making people from mud and breathing on them to bring them to life. Or the valley of dry bones that are so dry that nothing could wake them and God breathing on them and they come to life. The gospels are not meant to be weapons with which to beat each other up. They are good news. They are a fresh breeze when we have been cooped up inside for too long. They are deep, deep breath, filling our lungs, cleansing our hearts. We are enough to share the overwhelming love of God as we understand it. With our children here, with our friends and neighbors, we are enough because we have seen it in our own ways. And we can show the people around us that whether they are sad or happy or undeserving or successful, that we love them. 
that God loves them, whether they know why or not. With whatever burden you have brought with you to worship today, whatever wounds you are tending, whatever you're struggling with in your own personal upper room of misery or doubt, there is new life coming. And it's already here. It's elusive sometimes, but it's here nonetheless. New life can, must, should, and absolutely will come out of death. Jesus shows up in surprising places and asks for our questions. And this is not the end of our story. Grief and death don't get the final word. Jesus does. So peace be with you. Dear God, while we rejoice in the new life you offer us during this Easter season, many of us struggle with our disbelief about the reality of Jesus' resurrection. At the same time, we long for reassurance about Jesus' ongoing presence with us. We know that Jesus helped his beloved followers understand the reality of his resurrection by physically appearing in the course of their everyday lives, showing his wounds, talking together, eating food with them. Remind us that Jesus longs to connect with us in everyday lives too, in ways that will bring us joy and peace. Grant us the ability to see and to rejoice in his presence. Help us to embrace Jesus' resurrection as the truest thing there is, proof of your eternal love for us all. God of love and mercy, hear our prayer. for all suffering from the effects of natural disasters and violence. May we provide them with prayers, compassion, and a helping hand. For all those who are lonely and suffering from emotional and physical illness. For all those who, who assist others to weather crises with hope and dignity. Let us do what we can to assist your saints in action. Send your healing spirit to those on our prayer list, especially Judy Yeager, Grayson Long, Tom Habig, Pat Noland, Louise Lowry, Dave Pavlik, Evelyn and Olivia Nemesuk, Rod Davidson, Angela Berner, Selah Maisie Hart, Wendy Jones, those grieving the loss of loved ones and for your own concerns.
We pray for the dearly departed, especially those we now name before you. Heavenly Mother and Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life, we may not forget you, but may remember that we are ever walking in your sight through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, let's close our time together with the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to share this blessing with you that we used to do at the campus ministry that I served before. This has three parts. Um, with each part, your response is Amen, Alleluia. The blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be on you. Amen, Alleluia. The blessing of God, Mother, Lover, and Friend be in you. Amen, Alleluia. The blessing of God, Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier, be from you. Amen. Alleluia. Let us bless the Lord. Let us go forth rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Alleluia. 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 Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. Alleluia.